are we doing, everybody? Okay, I can tell you guys are really excited. So here's what we're going to do. I need you all to stand up real quick. Stand up, stand up, stand up. All right, now I need you to find two people and let them know, I'm glad you're here. Let them know. You got to let them know. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Let them know. Hey, brother, my brother, the tall one right here, the green guy. The green guy, he's not even knowing that I'm pointing at him, but I'm pointing at him. Brother, I'm glad you're here. You, you look scared, but I'm glad you're here. Girl, I'm glad you're here, okay? Now, here's the thing. I know that you guys have heard this today, but you've got to know God gives his workers power to stand up from him, for him. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and let them know you can stand for him. You can stand for him. Matter of fact, in Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says this. You see, as just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Don't for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did. No. Here's what you guys need to know. See, when I was 15 years old, I knew who Jesus was. I was introduced to Jesus. And I was like, yeah, man, that sounds cool. Jesus, I like his name. Let's do this. Now, I also had a friend, and his name was Peter. And Peter and I, we did everything together. Peter and I, we went to, like, parties together. We went to sleepovers together. Matter of fact, everybody was just like, man, you guys are twins. I know he's white, you're black, but y'all are twins. You got this. And so him and I did everything. So one day, we're standing by our lockers, right? And we're chilling. We're just like, oh, man, I don't even know how to get past this math class. And the next thing you know, Lindsay Anderson begins to walk by. Now, yeah, okay, I got to stop using her real name. That's not good. I'm sure she's a nice person. She's good. Now, you also have to understand, Lindsay was like the hottest girl in our school at the time, okay? So I knew, come on, somebody. So I knew one of us had to talk to this girl. And so I'm like, oh, snap, Peter, I think I should be the one to talk to her. And Peter's all like, no, man, you've got to talk to the last girl. And I'm like, no, Peter, you don't understand. The last girl, she tried to bite me. It was a really weird relationship. And so we did what every guy does when he has a disagreement with his friend. Paper, rock, scissors. That's right. So we're sitting here. We're like, okay, man, I'll pay on three. One, two, three. Okay, first of all, you can't go before three because why are you saying three then? So we did it. Boom, I won. So I'm like, oh, snap. Okay, I'm going to talk to Lindsay Anderson. Now, I remember she was in my economics class. And so I remember, are you booing economics? We know he failed. So we're sitting here. And I remember she was sitting right across from me, and I looked at her, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write her a note, because back in the day, we didn't have no cell phones. You couldn't send somebody a text message. You had to write them a note. So I got her some paper, I got out a pen, and I began to write, Lindsay, do you like me? Circle yes or no, because you got to let people know what you want them to do. So I took that note, and I folded it up in a special kind of way, and I sent it down the row. And I'm like, yeah, give her the note. Yeah, yeah. No, not you, the other girl. I don't like you. And so, of course, Lindsay got the note, and she waved at me, and I was just like, you go, girl, you go. And so she opens up the note, she takes out a pen, and then she begins to write. And I'm like, hold on, Lindsay, I don't want to read your writing, I just want to read your circles. There's no need to write. But she wrote something down, then she took the note, and she folded it up in that special kind of way, and she sent it down the row. And I was just like, give me my note, give me my note. Give me my note. And so I got the note. I opened it up, and it said, if you want to know the answer to that, you have got to call me. And I'm like, hold on, Lindsay. You don't understand. I am a teenage boy. So when I get nervous, my voice sounds like I'm possessed. So I'm like, okay, Terrence. You could do this. Yeah, and so that night, I'm practicing by the phone. I'm like, all right, Terrence, just call her up and say, hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. I was like, ooh, too black. Pull it back. Pull it back. Okay. So I got the phone, and I begin to dial her. We had older phones back in the day. 
So I'm sitting there, I'm like, all right, Terrence, you can do this, you can do this. And then all of a sudden I heard, hello? And I'm like, hey, Lindsay. She's like, who is this? I'm like, sorry, Lindsay, I'm really nervous right now. Uh, this is Terrence, do you want to go out with me? And then there was this long pause, and then all of a sudden I heard, Terrence, I would love to go out with you. And so I did that dance that you do where no one's looking at you. And I was just like, hey, ho, oh, hey. And so Lindsay and I, we started to do everything together. Lindsay and I, we would meet each other by our lockers and we'd walk hand in hand with each other as we went to our class. And then, of course, when we had to go to separate classes, I go, I know, girl, I'm going to miss you. It's going to be a long 30 minutes, but I'm going to miss you. And so we would come back together and we would go to lunch together and we would share our mashed potatoes together and of course we would like talk to each other at night and it got to the point where we talked to each other so much that we didn't even have anything to say to each other and I was like just breathe girl just breathe I just want to hear you breathe and so I thought Lindsay was the one for me so I did what every person does when they think they found the one I introduced her to my mom and I was like mom I know I'm only 15 but this is the girl, this is the girl I'm gonna marry. And my mom, she looked at me and she goes, you're stupid, but I don't care. Because Lindsay Adams, she was one for me. So, after a glorious month and a half relationship, I knew I'd found the one, I had my best friend, I had my girlfriend, everything was set to go. One day I came to school, Lindsay, she's standing by my locker, I come up to her and I'm so excited, and she goes, uh, here you go, and she hands me a note, doesn't say anything else. I take the note, and she goes, don't open it until you get to class. And I'm like, sure, of course. So I got the note, I got to my class, I opened it up, and it said, Terrence, I like you, but I don't want to go out with you no more. <laughs> and I am crushed. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this, I thought she was the one, what, what's going on? And so, of course, as soon as class was done, I like run out, I'm trying to find my friend Peter, and I see him in the hallway, and I'm like, Peter, 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 I don't understand what happened. Uh, Lindsay, she gave me a note, she dumped me, I don't understand what's going on. And then Peter, he got this really weird look on his face, and he goes, Terrence, I'm sorry, I really like her, I saw her, and I'm sitting there. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened to me. And I'll never forget, Peter, he's like, Terrence, I am so sorry. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I am so sorry too. I'm going to have to choke you out right now. I am so sorry. <laughs> now, at that point, Peter and I, we were still friends. But something happened. And everything that I based my life upon was falling apart. Because even at the time, we're 15 years old. So I can't place my life on a relationship. I can't place my life on a friendship. But at the same time, when everything started to crumble, I started to crumble too. And I blamed this on God and I used this as a way to push God away. Because I'm like, God, I trusted you and this is what happened. But in reality, I did not trust God. I trust the things I set up for myself. Now you have to remember, Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No matter how bad we had been, he still says, you're worth it to me. And I'm going to help you. Just come to me. Now, I know that you guys have been learning about Elijah. So here's what we're going to do. And Elijah, first, or First Kings, there's no book called Elijah. And First Kings uh, 18, and we'll start with uh, verse 16. Now, Here's my thing. I love Elijah, okay? I love it. You're not going to be bored anymore. Trust me. I got you, brother. So I'm sitting there, and I'm reading this book, Elijah, and I'm thinking of it kind of like a movie. Anybody like movies around here? Movies? Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 snap. At the, in three seconds, tell me what your favorite movie is, okay? One, two, three, go. Yup. <laughs> Harry Potter and the what? <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorcerer Stone. Bro, that's so weird. That movie is probably older than you are. What? Okay, but here's the thing. I'm reading this. And I love how it starts off. Elijah, he just comes up on the scene. And, like, he doesn't have no, like, big old history. He just comes up on the scene. He's like, hey, it ain't going to rain up in this place until I say so. Because I'm a servant of the Lord. And everybody's like, oh, snap, who is this dude? I don't know this brother, whatever. And so it doesn't rain for all this time, right? And so people are like, okay, what's going on? But for Elijah, he knows that God has given him this, this message. Because the people... They're worshiping this God called Baal. And Elijah's just like, you can't worship two different peoples, two different gods. It can't happen. And so after it doesn't rain for a while, Abraham's people, they come up to him and they're like, yo, man, you can't do this no more. What, what is this? What's, what's going on over here? And so Elijah, and it says in verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And so they start talking. They're like, okay, so how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? And so Elijah, he's like, okay, we're going to have this thing called a God off, okay? God off means your God versus my God. And so he's just like, here's how this is going to break down. And it says on verse 24. I love this part, verse 24. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is the God. And this, is, this really says this. He goes, the people are all like, what you say is good. Whatever, bro, I got you. Like the people are just all chill with this, right? They're like, okay, that's cool, whatever. So they do this God off, right? Now there are 450 prophets of Baal, right? Now, wait, how, who's the youngest person in here? How do you know that? You got like a beard. You ain't the youngest person. Who, what, how old are you? I don't understand silence. Uh, who's back there? How many people are 12? Any 12s? Hey. Okay. Any 11-year-olds? 10? Are you seriously 10 years old? Okay, okay. Uh, we got to make sure we get this. Um, the Bible is pretty rated R sometimes. So I'm going to try to make this PG as best as possible. Okay, brother? Okay? This is me and you. Me and you right now. Okay. So there are 450 prophets of Baal, right? And so Elijah's like, all right. So you're going to have one offering over here. And we're going to cut this bull up. And then boom. And if your God comes down, then your God is the God. But I'm going to cut my bull up over here. And if... My God, which I know is true, he's going to come down and he's going to take it. And we're going to know he's the real God. People are like, all right, that's cool. So he's like, since I know y'all are ridiculous, I want you to go first. And so these prophets, they start singing and they're dancing. And at one point in time, they're taking their clothes off. I mean, uh, they're uh, inappropriate. So they're doing all these things, right? And so they're like calling on their God and they're like making sure they're like cutting themselves and whatnot and blood is coming out. And Elijah, he's just sitting back there. He's like, y'all look gross. I don't even know what you're doing. I don't know. And so after a while, all of a sudden Elijah's like, all right, enough of this. I can't do this no more. And so he comes over and he starts to go over to his offering. He's like, all right, I want you guys to take some water. And they're like, okay. He's like, pour it all around here. And so his people, they take the water, they pour it on there. And he's like, you know what, that's not enough. Get some more water. And they're like, for real? More water? He's like, yeah, yeah, do that. And so they take some more water and they pour it on there. He's like, you know what, just for good measure, do it one more time. And they're like, Elijah, really? Three more times? He's like, do it now. And so they take the water, they pour it down on there. Now, there is something that you need to know about this. Remember. There is a drought. It hadn't rained for a long time. And so they took the water that they had and they poured it. What does this say? It says this. Our God is not a plan B. God is always plan A. And at that moment of time, Elijah, God has given them that power to go, you can trust me. Take everything that you got, pour it on there. You stand for me, and I will take care of everything. So Elijah, he pours the water on, and he's like, all right, 
Now, Lord, I know you're the true Lord, but you need to show all these other people that you're the real God. And so all of a sudden, next thing you know, a big ball of fire comes down, whooshes up the offering, takes up the wood, soaks up the water, and then everybody's like, oh, snap, that's the real God. And so they start, like, laying down. They're thinking, oh, thank you, Lord. And at this time, Elijah, he's sitting over here. He's like, you know what? All you bad, naughty prophets, 450 of them, and this is the part where it gets rated R. Cover your ears. He slaughters 450 prophets of Baal. Slaughters them. I mean, okay, ma'am, you're looking at me like you are scaring me. But it's true. It's true, right? It's true. It says so in the Bible. And so he murders these people, and he's just like, all right, now we got to make sure that the rain comes up in here. And so he sends this person to go down and tell the people, hey, the rain cloud's coming. And he's like, you know what, y'all are too slow. I'm going to run ahead of you. So he starts running. Now, the cool thing about this story is this to me. There's a drought going on, and you have two kinds of people. You have the people that were thirsty. And maybe they're worshiping Baal because they're hoping Maybe this will be the answer for them. But then there are the people that just wanted an idol. They just was like, you know what, I'm going to mix this in with my stuff. And this God's a good God too and your God's a good God too. And then Elijah, he's saying, you can't go between two different worlds. It's impossible. Case in point, there's this uh, story about this girl. She had just graduated from high school, right? She's like 17 years old, and she was engaged to get married. And so before she got married, she told her fiancé, hey, I really feel like God has put on my heart to go do some mission work. And her, her boyfriend was like, okay, you go do your mission work for a couple weeks, and then when you get back, We're going to get married. And so this girl, she went off and she started to do her mission work. But everything started to go really well. And then finally, a couple weeks passed by. And she's like, you know what? I I need to stay here a little longer. And so her fiancé, he's like, okay, I'm going to give you one more month. And then we're going to get married when you come back. Cool. And so she starts to get into all this work. And so finally, she goes, just give me a little bit more time. And then her fiancé writes back. You don't need to come back for me. I found someone else. So that woman, she stayed and she continued her mission work. Even though he, she had something back home, she knew that God had placed her in this, in this city with these people to serve them. Mother Teresa affected over thousands of children. And it would have been really easy for her to go, you know what? I got something back home and, and I can't live without my, my fiance. I can't live without my friends here. But God said, no. You stand up for me and I will take care of you no matter what happens. And I know it's really hard. You guys are coming to camp and it's just like, man, this is so awesome. I love Nine Square. That's cool. But after you leave here, you're going to have a decision to make. And it might even come down to tonight. You can't go to other things to quench your thirst. You can't rely on your friendships. But then also at the same time, you can't rely and serve two different gods. It's impossible. You have to take a stand. Um, Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, God died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you know he's going to take care of you. You know he's going to say, hey, you can stand. Uh, Last story I'll tell, because I love telling stories, is... um, You guys may not know this, but uh, my full-time job during the school year is I go around and I do school assemblies. And I tell kids in public schools that somebody loves them. And so I'll never forget, it was this one school assembly. Gym was empty at the time, and I'm getting ready for this assembly. And the next thing I know, these special needs children come in and they sit on the corner. Now, the minute they come in, I'm going to myself, okay, no matter what happens, I don't care who comes into this room, 
I'm going to make sure these kids have a smile on their face when I'm done. So all the kids come in. There's hundreds of students sitting there. And so the whole assembly, I'm going, I'm like, and I'm looking at these special needs students. I'm like, and they're like having this good time, right? So as soon as the assembly was done, kids are getting up. They're saying bye. They're like hugging one another. I'm standing over to the side. I'm like, this is great. And then all of a sudden, I'll never forget it. This special needs girl gets up from her seat. She gets her, her uh, handle. And she begins to walk over with her walker. And she's walking really slow. And I see her and her and I catch eyes with each other. And she's coming over towards me. And her smile is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And she gets up to me and she goes, I need a hug from you. And I go, yeah. And I came in and I gave her a hug. And she goes, why are you at my school today? And I go, you want to know a secret? She goes, yeah. I go, Because I want to make sure that every single student knows that God loves them. And she goes, you know Jesus? And I go, yeah, I do. And she goes, I know Jesus too. I can talk about him. I go, what? And she takes her walker and she goes over back to her friends. And she begins to give each and every one of her friends a hug. And she tells all of her friends about Jesus right there in that school. What people call special needs, God says special purpose. And whatever happens, if she had the power of God, gave her the power to stand up and to speak his name. And even physically, she needed the power to stand up. God gave it to her. Why? Simple. God gives his workers power to stand up for him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for letting us be able to stand, but not only letting us be able to stand up for you, but giving us the power to do so. Lord, I pray for each and every single student in this room that no matter what may go by, that they will know when it's time for them to take a stand, when it's time for you, you are calling them, and when it's time for them to step step up and do what they're supposed to do, that, Lord, they will not question it because they know that their God is going to be with them and he's going to stand with them. We thank you and we just praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.